Hello, I am uh, Dr. Angie Abdu, and I teach creative writing at Athabasca University. And I'm with Reinika Langell, who teaches also teaches writing at Athabasca, Athabasca in the Master of Arts and Interdisciplinary Studies program. And we are going to talk uh, today about her book, Writing the Self in Bereavement. Hi, Reinika. Hi. I thought I'll just hold it up here so you can see the cover. So, yeah. It's a very nice cover, and it's from a very reputable press in uh, New York, Rutledge. So congratulations on the publication. It's pretty new. How is it feeling to have a pretty personal book out in the world? Uh, yeah, well, good. Wonderful, really. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm grateful. Grateful. Good. I wanted to ask you, uh, first, can you just define self-writing? I know it seems very obvious to you because it's what you do. It's what you've made your life around. But can you define it for people who are unfamiliar with the term? Uh, yeah, writing the self is basically using writing as a transformative process in your own life. So uh, we often have stories that are, well, stories sort of script our lives. You know, the stories we tell about our identities script our lives. And so the quality of the story that you tell about your life influences how well, you know, you do in life and how you thrive. And of course, we know that we've grown up with a lot of you know, um, not so useful narratives that uh, if they hang on too long, they really influence uh, how well we do uh, in our relationships and in our work and all that. So writing the self allows us to question, to explore what narratives are working and what narratives we walk around with and also how to change them. Excellent. And so this book is around a very traumatic narrative, the story of your husband's death. Um, are all writing self projects around traumatic narratives generally? Like when you're working with your students, do, do they tend to focus on hard hard parts of life more often? I, I would say that we gravitate towards what we, I call boundary experiences. That's what I use in my model of writing for transformation is th that something that really impacts our lives. That doesn't mean it has to be a, a, a traumatic, traumatic thing. It could be like, for instance, the birth of a child that throws your career trajectory into a, you know, a different mode and you feel like I, I haven't found the balance with it. I like being home with my child, but I'm also feeling unfulfilled. And so that's a boundary experience too, even though it's a very joyful experience, right? To have, mm -hmm. to have a child if you, you wanted a family, so. So you both teach this kind of writing and you write about this kind of writing in your role as an academic and you practice this kind of writing in your personal life and your publication life. And so with writing the, the self and bereavement, I found it a very, um, book unlike anything else I'd ever written, ever read. Sorry, it was very unlike anything else I'd ever read. And I, I don't know if enjoy is the right word. Maybe that's not a very nice word to use because it's a sad time in your life. But I felt like it, I felt it was a transformative reading experience as well as a transformative writing experience, I imagine. So I wonder when you're going through this with yourself and students, this, you know, shaping your own narrative, um, what then, if the, if the point of that is to live a better life or a more insightful life or a more aware life. What's the point of taking the next step Step to publish? Is that necessary in the process? Um, you know, it often isn't for students. If they want to, they can. And, and very students have published, like I have a recent student who published in the Journal of Autoethnography about her um, patient advocacy story. So, you know, ending up in hospital with uh, complications and, and uh, you know, medical mistakes sort of being made and how she became a patient advocate as a result of that. And that story is published. So it's, and she feels great about it being published. So various students have actually gone on to publish their stories, but sometimes no, I'd say no, because say you write about um, the mental illness of your father or something, and he's still alive uh, and you don't, you know, and your siblings are not, wouldn't be happy for you to do that, but you didn't really need to share it with a greater group. You felt that the experience of writing it yourself was, was okay to do, you know, and that that, that mm -hmm. gave satisfaction you needed. So um, publishing isn't always, isn't always the end goal. Just like piano lessons doesn't mean everyone's going to become a performer. They might enjoy piano at home and it'd be very therapeutic for them and, and life-giving, you know. Yeah. What does the publication part add to your experience as a writer? Why is it important for you to publish? Um, well, it, it's, um, I did feel compelled to, to share it if it was valuable to others. And, uh, you know, if, you know, the editor saw that it was valuable, she felt it was valuable. So it's wonderful to share that because I guess my motivation as an instructor and as a human being is 
can I do something, can I contribute from my life experience something that actually would free somebody else to have less shame, uh, you know, less shyness, um, a, a, you know, re suffering in life and give them permission to actually feel and express. I mean, that that's, you know, is my ultimate joy in, in interacting with people. So. Yeah, I think you very much accomplished that in your book. One of the things I found surprising uh, or different or unusual about your book was the mix of genres. You know, in some pages you'd be very academic and engaging in the research. Some places it would feel kind of very personal, like a diary, but in prose form. Some places there'd be poetry and then it was very mixed. And so I guess I want to ask you about poetry. What does poetry add in that sort of writing scenario that maybe you can't get at with other genres? Um, poetry is, is like, um, one of my students long time said it's shorthand of the soul, you, you know, mm. and I, how she said that Marlis Weber said this and, uh, I, I like it because it really is like a captured a moment in time that is really, really poignant, but you don't want to go on and on about it and you don't want to analyze it and you don't want to tell people or the reader what to think of it. You don't even want to tell yourself what to think of it. You actually want to be present to the experience. And that's what I think poetry gives us. Beautiful. Did you change, I mean, given the nature of writing the self, the idea, I suppose, is that you would change from the start of writing a book to the end of one. Did you change from the start of this writing, uh, writing the self and bereavement to when you finished it? Was it a transformative process for you? You know, it, it wasn't. And I, I, a whole chapter is devoted to how it was, um, you know, at the end of the book. And I, the, the part, I guess, what I want to say about it, first, the book kept me company. Like, I missed Franz so much, and I thought we talked a couple hours a day even when we were apart. We were just so engaged with each other that him dying was like, I thought, okay, I don't want to fall into the abyss of the non-dialogue, you know, with him. So it kept me company in that way. I, I continued my conversation with him. Um, but also, it allowed me to work through some things that were more difficult about the grief. Like grief is difficult in the sense that you feel that loneliness and you feel that bereftness of not having your partner, not having that partner curl up with you in the evening, you know, or, or talk to you or listen to you and all that. That's, that's one part of it. But the other part of it also was some unfinished business that he and I had a relationship issue that we'd never resolved and that couldn't really be resolved. Um, and the book allowed me to spend time with that issue and imagine talking about it with him still post death you know mm -hmm. uh, i have a log in there that is a fictional dialogue where i imagine um you know if Franz was speaking from a complete place of of acceptance and patience on how he might engage with me in that in that way and so so those things were i needed to spend time with the things that were still edgy or painful and and unfulfilled so that was part of it as well yeah, and also forward, like, you know, like, I have a new uh, partner in my life, and, like, how do you navigate that? Because your love for the deceased partner doesn't change, really, that it just stays very much a part of you. So how do you move on to the next phase of your life and do that joyfully? And giving yourself permission to actually be happy when you're happy. Yeah, it's fascinating. I appreciate you sharing all of that. I... um wanted to ask you about your students then because you're going through this process when you write this book and it's very personal and it's uh, very hard and it can be transformative and so when you're working with students on that material you're not just a writing teacher I would imagine but you're having to guide them through some pretty personal introspection and transformation how do you how do you manage that in your courses um, you know the most my, my role is to witness compassionately. And I'm very aware that I'm not a counselor and I'm not trained to be a psychotherapist or anything. So I'm careful not to cross that line. I really stay with um, the text and that person. So I am constantly reflecting back what I'm hearing so I can be that guide at the side. And I might um, shed like a little, I might add a little light, like interesting how you combine this with this. That seems like you're, seems like there's some peace in combining those two things. Like I might say something like that. Uh, but overall, I'm, um, the the power of it is that they are their own guru, you know, they're their own wisdom. And, and so I am not, um, I'm not wanting to take that away from them by being some kind of star teacher, you know, I don't want to be that star teacher. They are their, they are their own star. 
And, and mm-hmm. that's what I want them to realize and see at the end that they don't actually need me, but I'm happy to have been that witness for them during that journey. So, so that's actually the most powerful thing that I do is they know they're being heard and seen. And that's why they hear themselves better. You know, that's it. Oh, that's a wonderful note to end on. I, I loved your book. And I think um, Athabasca University is very lucky to have you on faculty and our students are very lucky to be able to work with you. Congratulations on the new publication. Thank you so much, Angie.